after this urgent protest against entering into battle at Gettysburg, according to instructions, which protest is the first and only one I ever made during my entire military career? I ordered my line to advance and make the assault. John Bell Hood Welcome friends, thanks for joining us again for another episode in our Gettysburg series. So I will be covering three days, then I will be doing extra videos to go into the subjects like specific units and commanders and other individuals and events to give better context to everything. But today we will be discussing July 2nd, 1863. That day, the day that pretty much decided the outcome of the battle. I find this the most interesting day, being it's when such famous actions took place, as well as the most Medal of Honors given out in a battle. So let's begin at Robert E. Lee's headquarters, the morning of the 2nd. Lee had gathered his corps generals, along with division generals of commanders present on the field. His plan is simple. General Ewell, being not as engaged on the first day as A.P. Hill's corps, will attack the high ground at Culp's Hill. General A.P. Hill will harass the Union Center. Not necessarily attack, but make it that they have to hold the position and not move troops, because to their knowledge, the Union line spread then. Meanwhile, General James Longstreet and his 1st Corps will swing south, take the hills beyond, and fire on the interior of the Union lines. James Longstreet is very reluctant. He doesn't believe the reconnaissance saying the Union line stopped short of those hills is true. He'd rather go further south and come up completely behind the Union lines. But Lee believes if they do that, then the Union troops will occupy the hills, and while he did that, it would give the Union time to ward off Ewell and then prepare for Longstreet's maneuver. Longstreet reluctantly agrees to Lee's orders and positions Generals John Bell Hood and Lafayette McClaws facing the Union 3rd Corps. Now we move across the field to our dear friend, Mr. Dan Sickles. Now, as a New Yorker, I am proud and disgraced to claim Dan Sickles as one of us. Dan Sickles was a New York politician who bought his commission as a general. To say he was a bad general isn't true, but he wasn't a great one either. Meade the morning of the second gave strict orders to all commanders not to advance, to just hold in place. Sickles, however, recognizing the land ahead of his position near a peach orchard was elevated, decided to advance. Now, before he had been defeated by Confederates who took advantage of the terrain. So, ignoring Meade's directions, he advanced to that position, leaving a massive gap in the Union line. It was at this point Meade rode to Sickles to scold him for disobeying his order, which any officer would do when your subordinate disobeys you. But it was at this time Lafayette McClaw's division began to advance after Longstreet spent the morning delaying the attack. Meade at this point knew he did not have time to pull the 3rd Corps back and rode hard to General Hancock. Hancock was in charge of the Union Center, in which many of his brigades were sitting idly in reserve. Meanwhile, in the Peach Orchard, the 3rd Corps' morale continued to drop. To the south, they could see the men of General Hood's division moving past them. Many of the soldiers feared they were going to be surrounded. The only thing, in fact, keeping their morale up was the fact that General Sickles was leading them. But soon, Sickles became wounded, taking a cannonball from the leg, twisting it completely backwards. There's two versions of Sickles getting wounded. The first version, which Sickles favors, was he calmly was carried off the field while smoking a cigar. The other, which was noted by more eyewitnesses, including members of his staff, was he was screaming in great pain, which in my opinion medically makes more sense if your leg is twisted backwards. While the Third Corps is being pushed now, th pushed now though, Hancock had committed his first division under John Caldwell to delay the Confederates. This is a bit of a sad reality. This action was only to give the army time to reform the fishhook. 
While General Humphreys of the Third Corps held back the attack in the northeast by the Spangler House and Peach Orchard, General Caldwell moved into the weak field. Now, within Caldwell Division was Patrick Kelly and the Irish Brigade. We will do a separate video on the Irish Brigade, explain them up, up until they entered the wheat field, simply because a lot happens the second day, and being I have connections to the Irish Brigade, I wish to give them the respect they deserve. So, while Caldwell began to send his brigades in, the 5th Corps under Sykes and, six, and elements of the 6th Corps under Sedgwick moved south around the Round Tops in order to seal the flank of the army. Originally, the Union forces weren't concerned. Only when Hancock's chief engineer, Governor Warren, sighted Confederate flanking towards the hills did movement happen, thus saving the position. Now as the 5th and 6th Corps settled in their positions, below they could see as Hood's infantry began to chase elements of Burney's division through a large collection of rocks called Devil's Den. Quickly putting them into full retreat, though, the rocks and into a place called Plum Run, which the people of Gettysburg would later name Bloody Run. In the wheat field, the Irish Brigade had actually pushed many of McClaw's men back, but they and other brigades in Caldwell's Brigade got uh, them and other regiments, my apologies, in Caldwell's Brigade got caught in Confederate crossfire. After fighting almost all morning, Caldwell and Humphreys finally withdrew. Both divisions significantly bloodied. The rest of McClaws and Hood's division pushed forward. But unfortunately for the Confederate General Hood, the Confederates General Hood had been wounded in Devil's Den while trying to survey the advance. Now, what remained of the Confederate divisions had to move to their next objective, take the hills and outflank the Union line. Colonel Strong Vincent commanded a brigade of the 5th Corps holding the extreme left of the Union line. The position that had to hold, he had placed his left in command of a main regiment commanded by a Bowdoin professor named Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Remnants of the 3rd Corps and, separ and separated on the men of the 2nd Corps began to fall in line with the men on the round tops after being chased to the top of the hill. An Irish colonel named O'Rourke had already chased the Confederates off the little round top at the cost of his own life. But Confederate regiments had reformed and men of Hood and McClaws continued to charge up the hill. Colonel Vincent during one of these attacks would actually be shot in the groin, dying five days later. Hancock sent an artillery battery a little round top to help the 5th Corps. But then their commander, Captain John Hazard, was killed. Little Round Top had quickly become a chaotic mash of 3rd, 5th, 2nd, and 6th Corps soldiers, fighting for their lives to hold off the relentless waves of Cal Confederates. As the day continued, though, ammunition became lower and lower for the Northerners. It was at this time Colonel Chamberlain was faced with a very important decision. He could withdraw and let the entire Union line collapse or do something drastic. After talking to his regimental officers, a decision was made to charge the Confederates. So as the last wave of Confederates came up the hill, one last volley was fired. Then Chamberlain gave the, the command to charge. Early in the day, Chamberlain had in fact sent a skirmish company out that he thought was decimated. But as they charged down the hill, the company rose up, firing into the retreating Confederates. At this point in the day, throughout the southern front, Men of Longstreet's Corps, exhausted and dying of thirst, finally withdrew. A big forgotten fact many people don't know is the night of the 1st into the 2nd, small skirmishes took place over where Federal or Rebel troops could get water. So the reality was a lot of the Confederate soldiers involved had no water and were dying of thirst, but impressively they still continued to fight throughout the day. Now I did warn this will be a long video. This will um, this video will be a long one because now we are going to move over to Ewell's attack. But since this video went very long due to the chaos of the second day, what happened at Culp's Hill will be equally as long, including what happened at Cemetery Ridge. So I will be doing a second part of the second day, but I will like to finish by saying by this off by saying Joshua Chamberlain will go on to earn a Congressional Medal of Honor 
for his bravery on July 2nd. And many units of Caldwell's division, who was sent to delay the Confederate forces, will never be the size they were, again, just due to the sheer carnage they suffered, to give the Army of the Potomac time to reorganize. Dan Sickles will actually be court-martialed, but escape punishment due to his connections in the War Department and government. Then would begin a 34-year campaign of smearing his superior, George Meade, stating that Meade never gave him the credit for winning, in quote, the battle. After 34 years of campaigning, Sickles would receive the Congressional Medal of Honor, though to this day it is still one of the most controversial awardings of the honor. Thanks for watching. We will have the next episode up immediately. I am aware this one ran long. I'll be honest. I still did not cover everything that happened on the second day Southern the Front, but there's only so much in one video. Please like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one. See you real soon, guys.